So I've got definitely at least one, two things I'd like to talk about further in the psalm. So I'm not going to let it go crazy long if there's no questions. I'm going to say questions, and I'm ready to move. So any questions? Oh, please. Oh, blank. We're missing blanks. 3C. 3C is, oh, yes, he confesses his finitude or his smallness in the Lord's eternality. Okay. Eternality. He calls upon the Lord to prolong his days. Nope. Nope. Oh. Created the heavens and the earth. He will utterly outlast them all, as will his people who dwell secure with him. Okay. Simeon, get your hand up. I'm grab a Bible here. That'd be probably a good idea. Okay. Simeon, what you got? Okay, I can't find the verse exactly, but it you were talking about how um, he was hoping in Zion and yes. the coming and the yes. future of it. How does that? How does Zion apply to us and oh, that? That's work? one of the two things I want to talk about. So All I'm right. going to pause. We will get to that. We cool. absolutely will. But let me see if anyone else got any other questions. That's one of the two things I want to talk about. Great question, Simeon. Great question. Sarah. Okay, so you said that it's okay to feel like you're at the end of yourself, yes. but you have to come back to who God is. Yes. So when you're in that situation, that's a really hard thing to do. Yes. Practically, how do we get to that point? Practically, how do we get there? Um, this is, well, practically teaching on topics like this before the whirlwind is part. There's a number of ways. One, this is why it's important to teach on these things and teach on suffering. If you're sitting here today and you're not in the end of your rope and you can't remember a time and you're at the end of the rope, this is still a great, and you're tempted to think, I'm not clinically depressed. I'm not wasting away. I'm not, I'm in, I'm in a good season of life. So why do I need to listen to this? You need to hear this so that when you are in that situation, you've got some markings of what to do because it is a storm. So that'd be the first thing. It's one of the reasons why I'll try to emphasize trusting in God and suffering. It's really hard to tell someone that in the midst of the storm. It's really hard to tell. If you think God only does nice things, and then you have the child die, the job gets lost, the cancer comes, and you're grappling with that, it is really hard in that storm to learn you did this, right? To say what the psalmist says. So it's far better to, to get that. So there's a preventative sort of prophylactic effect of this that prevent an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure of getting these things in place. That'd be the first thing. The second is um, this is why we need to gather together. Hebrews 3.12 warns us against um, beware lest there be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart and falling away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day while it's still called today lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So precisely because when I most need an exhortation, I'm most unlikely to give it to myself is when I need other people. So, so being in fellowship and being around other believers, the other part is this instruction. You may be in a good season of life. You may precisely need to walk someone through these truths who is so weak and is so out of their sorts and so desperate that they, they can't do this themselves. This is precisely why we need each other. So another aspect of this psalm, you may not need to preach and teach this psalm to yourself. You may need to walk someone else through it. Um, that, that would be the other point. The third point would be if you recognize that you can, you can read books, you can listen to sermons. There's a lot of ways you can encounter a good teaching at your own pace, at your own time, in your own place, especially in today's multimedia world. Um, anyone want to add anything to those? Those are just off the top of my head ways you can sort of help yourself do this. Um, with the body of Christ, having some of these things in place beforehand. And so, and so what happens if, if I find myself here, and I'll, and I'll do this sometimes, um, I am really upset or really anxious about this. Like when I had my MRI coming up, I'm really getting anxious about this. And, and there's an appropriate level of anxiousness for it. I mean, this psalm makes it clear. It's not... Don't worry, God's in control. Be happy. No, there's, a, there's an appropriate level of anxiety, I think. Ron's tests, I'm sure there's a certain amount of 
Oh, he's gone. There's a certain amount of anxiety or apprehension before he takes a scan that I think is wholly prudent. If Ron came at it with a careless, case sera, sera, whatever it will be, will be, there'd be something actually not right, I think, in that. This is a serious scan. It's going to give some serious results. It's going to indicate some serious things, right? It's weighty. Uh, the problem is we tend to disproportionately evaluate those things. So if I start recognizing, like, man, and the, and the signposts are things like, can I still take joy in God? Can I still find joy in, in being with God's people? Can I still feed from God's word? Usually I'm like, no, I'm too anxious. I can't read the Bible. I'm too anxious. I can't pray. I'm too anxious. Okay, that, now, now this is disproportionately large in my eyes. Okay. And if you have the sense of thinking this, and I don't do this all the time, the problem is I don't know when I don't do it. I only know the few times I do. So there are, there, God's, by God's grace, there have been times where I've thought, what I really need to do is just take a big dose of reading about who God is. And either a passage in scripture or throwing on a sermon. John Piper is really good at God exalting things, making God big and bright, at least to, to my ears he is. I, I, I find a lot of comfort from getting a John Piper sermon is just going to lift God up, lift Christ up and exalt him. And That's the type of stuff that will usually help me. Okay, okay, I, I feel more balanced. It's kind of like a boat with ballast in the keel. A keel on a boat, and the weight, the bottom stabilizes it, even in the rough storm. And I think that a big view of God and his, I mean, I'm just directly ripping Piper off now. This ballast illustration is totally his. Um, but but the, the scripture again and again roots confidence in who God is, what he has done, what his character is like, is that ballast in the keel of a boat that stabilizes it in the midst of a tumultuous sea. And if you've ever, ever been in like a rowboat, something that doesn't have that, it's unstable, it can tip over, it's completely different than being in a boat with a hull and a keel and ballast that's stabilized. So that's, that's the short answered version to that. Anything else? Oh, Stacy in the back. I think you had said, does anyone have any other suggestions oh, in yes, relation I to this question? So I was, just, suggestions. I was just thinking in a very practical way, since we know that we're instructed to recount God's goodness, uh, mm. to recount his deeds. And there's plenty of places to go to in the Psalms. And mm. uh, even Moses' song, just reading through what God did to deliver his people. Mm. But what's also helpful, too, is to keep a record of his works in our own lives, yeah. which I know sounds like a really you know preschool mommy kind of thing, but it it's, right real, of, it's real it, helpful. It comes right out of this psalm. What, the, let this be a record, I think, most immediately applies to Psalm 102. So no, you, you're dead on the money. A journal. Psalm 102 is the prayer journal of the psalmist. And, and partway through the prayer journal, let this be written for a generation. <laughs> no, you're absolutely, abs- keep, no, keep going, but you're absolutely on the money. That's I, not a stretch or a mommy thing. That's a, that's a psalmist thing. I can relate to being in that place where it's hard to recount many things when you're in the midst of the swirl and... Um, I think hymns are very helpful. They tend to come, uh, the verses of hymns tend to come quickly to me even more than memorize scripture. Mm. And so that's a helpful thing to have uh, at your, you know, at easily accessible. And then also just that, that journaling to be able to look back and, and recall specifically what the Lord has done in our own lives. Yeah, Ab- absolutely. Christian biographies can be really helpful as well. Although I'm sure that's not a, a, a genre of literature that's you know, just jumping off the shelves. But hearing about God's faithfulness in the life of other believers. Or even finding someone. I mean, go talk to Phil. and have, Hey, Phil, tell me about God's faithfulness over the last few years. It'll start helping you remember both who God is and putting your own situations in perspective. It, it, with anyone who's gone through suffering, anyone who's going through it. If you live long enough, you'll suffer. Go talk to a saint and say, hey, tell me, tell me about how God's been faithful to you in tough times. I'm sure most people who've been a Christian for more than a few months will have something to say. Uh, <laughs> you know, and so there's many, many sources. Oh, Greg, and then Carol. Carol's like, oh, you brought hymns up. I got something to say <laughs> about that. Did you know that it is well, sorry. Go, Greg. Well, I was just going to say one preemptive thing that I think it's important for all of us is to be involved in the lives of people around us. Mm. And pretty quickly, once we... I mean, if any of us turn the spotlight of our attention into ourselves, we can very quickly uh, end up feeling like life's pretty miserable for us. Yeah. But if we are 
deeply involved in the lives of other people. And I don't need to name names. They just other people. Just, everybody is facing th stuff. Uh, and as we see that, we we get a better balance, I think, of how this isn't an aberration that I'm going through difficult times. Everybody goes through difficult times. Mm. I'm glad my difficult time is not as bad as that person's difficult time. And and I just think it's a a wonderful way to keep from becoming introspective and and um, and having those. I'm not speaking to you now, Sarah, completely, but I, those difficult times when you think, woe is me, mm. and it, that's just a natural thing to do if you're thinking about me. Yeah. Uh, you just do that. And, yeah. and, uh, but if you're thinking about others, oftentimes uh, you think, well, what I'm going through is stinks, but it's, I'm just glad I'm not going through that, you know, and it, it changes your perspective completely. Mm. Mm. Yep. Carol. Okay. Well, this is, this is going back to, to Sarah's little bit too, but I was thinking of the importance of the regular devotional time with mm. God in college. We used to call it the quiet time. Mm. And, uh, ideally in the morning, uh, I'm not a morning person, but you know whether you feel like it or not. When you're in the in the absolute pit, you go and you spend time with God, and you open the Word and you pray. And uh, you mentioned John Piper. I heard John Piper mentioned in a sermon once. He said something to the effect that he was wired. The way he was wired was to kind of wake up in the morning depressed. And uh, I, that wasn't his exact words, but that's what he was saying. Yeah. And I, I remember when I heard that, I thought, wow, I'm not the only one. You know, I mean, sometimes I'll wake up in the morning, I'll just think, oh, my goodness, I don't know if I can even get out of bed. But if you sit down and you force yourself to begin with to read the scripture, mm -hmm. come up with some thoughts, pray, changes your whole outlook. You know. Amen. Amen. Now, this is all... This is all Okay, I, I got distracted a second earlier. Phil, I got to, can I use you to tell one story? You're, it's a good one for you. You might be embarrassed. Just to give you an idea of how this stuff can affect people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embarrass two people at once here. Mark Sullivan, who's not here, told me about a time you told him that your legs were really bothering you with hives at Walmart, and you stepped outside, and you saw a guy go by you who had no legs in a wheelchair, and and how that helped put things into perspective. And you telling that to him stuck with Mark enough that he told, I and mean, there's like this ripple effect of encouragement and reminder that I want to highlight. I, I remember that day vividly because I, I was feeling some of this self, not necessarily pity, but, but why in the world am I having to go through this? And as I walked out that door, here comes a man in the door, younger, far younger than I am, of course most people are, but <laughs> both legs off above his knees in the wheelchair, and I said, Lord, there's a man that would like to have hives on his legs. And, and Mark, if you're listening, I only tell this to illustrate the effect of us speaking truth each other can have. Phil, the Lord instructs Phil to Walmart Phil instructs Mark, Mark tells me, and now it's edifying. I mean, so, so this again gets back to how we can encourage each other um, and how encouragement in the body can have a ripple effect. So, yeah. Oh! I've always enjoyed the saying, don't count your troubles, you count your blessings. So in our times of trouble, Ron and I have counted the blessings that mm. we've get, gotten mm. through church, family, friends, you know, being able to live as long as Ron has, it's not something that a lot of people have had with cancer. Mm. He's, you know, lived a long life from his first diagnosis. And let's not forget you coming back from the brink. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think of that a lot, too. Yeah. I just, you know, think of the blessings that I received yeah. from it. And that way I don't dwell on the doom and gloom right. because the blessings outweigh what that was all about. And that's that, I think that's probably the best litmus test of whether our, because 
this comes back to what you were even saying. The Psalms deal with sorrow. Just because you're sorrowful, just because you're heavy burdened, heavy laden and burdened, just because you're groaning and doesn't necessarily mean you are, uh, what? What's going on? Sorry. You guys are done. I can wait. Sorry. Um, doesn't mean you're, you're wrong. And that's one of the things I want to fight is this notion that Christians are always happy. We're happy all the time. Oh, no, I'm stepping on toes now. Um, and uh, no, read the Psalms. We're not happy all the time. How do I know if my sorrow is too large? My focus is too much on myself. Can I press pause for a minute? Worship God. Can I press pause for a minute? Go minister to someone else. Can I look away from myself for a minute and look at God? If I can, I can go serve someone and I can go pray and I can go read the word. I'm probably doing okay. It's probably about certainly if I can't, it's now too great of a matter. I've now things are out of proportion. So um, I, I'll use that as a good litmus test. Can I can I stop and do family devotions with my family? Can I stop and pray with my wife? Can I stop and you know, set aside my concern about X and, and focus on the Lord. If I can't, well, now I know this is, this is, I'm too worried about this. I'm too upset about this. Um, okay. Yes, Ron. Um, two things. Um, a couple months ago, a lady that worked for me, um, just out of the blue, she said she had been praying for me and that um, God had burdened her heart to tell me that um, I was going to live a long life. So I thought that was... I don't believe things just happened, but I was just taken back that she would, you know, first of all, think about praying for me like that, and then she felt God had spoken to her. The other thing, on Friday when Blanche had her scan, a lady in the office was, her husband has malignant melanoma like I have, and she was kind of expressing, you know, despair because of the seriousness, and so we tried to kind of share with her that, um, you know, two things one of the main things is, you know, you got to trust in the Lord that God puts us here and that things happen for a purpose. And um, she just, you know, I, I wish I'd had more time, but you don't necessarily in a waiting room want to, and, you know, like I heard a friend of mine say, sometimes people only need a bushel basket. They don't need the whole trailer full of feed. So right. beverage sometimes is the best, but right. I thank God for that opportunity. Right. I got 10 minutes to deal with Simeon's thing. Any other burning questions? Oh, in the back. Okay, we'll the microphone. We'll do this quickly. I got to cover two big just, topics in 10 minutes. Just real quick. We've, yeah. we've been in the swirl. We've been in the crisis. And when it happened to us, there was a point I couldn't pray. Everybody had to take care of us. So remember, when people are in the swirl, it's hard to pray. It's hard to focus. But then the body of Christ comes right. in. And you guys take over for the prayer right. and the needs and everything. So just which body is, Christ which is, is why important. Pulling back and isolating yourself is the worst thing you can do. The, the, that's what we tend to do. When we feel overwhelmed, we kind of want to go hide in the corner. Like that's, and if someone's doing that, go find them. Don't, don't believe them when they say they want to be like, you know, go be the person who's, I showed up with a, you know, with some scones or muffins. Let's, I'm, I'm coming in. You know, like get, don't let people isolate themselves who are suffering. Um, at least not for long. Okay, Simeon's question and what I want to deal with. So, uh, interpreting the Bible is, is let, me, let me bleed the two issues together to make one issue because i got 10 minutes. Okay. Um, I want to talk about how Hebrews quotes this. It says, as I'm studying through Psalm 102, the commentators are all basically saying, we know, because Hebrews 1 quotes this, this is messianic. But I read through Psalm 102, and I don't see anything overtly messianic in it whatsoever. Um, we'll, we'll deal with this in just a second. Yet Hebrews is right. I'm not saying Hebrews is wrong. I'm saying the conclusion that just because Hebrews cites it to teach us something about Jesus does not mean necessarily Psalm 102 is messianic. If I was to do the real quick flow of Psalm 102, a desperate cry to God, a laying out of the complaint in a long, big look away at God and his promises for Zion and his eternality, a return now with a much less urgent, still, give me more time, however, I know I dwell with you. Like, that's the movement of the song. I don't see where the Messiah jumps out of that. Um, and maybe he's there. The second question, then, is what do you do with the references to Zion and Jerusalem? Um, the reason why these sort of go hand in hand is this. There are there are a lot of, at root element, 
the differences between the major schools of conservative evangelical theology come down to interpretive principles, what are called hermeneutics. So the difference at root level between an amillennialist, someone who thinks the, the, all the language of all the kingdom language, which would include the Jerusalem rebuilt, kingdoms coming, all that language, is going to have a spiritual fulfillment in this age, here and now through the church, something like that. I'm using real broad brushstrokes. Um, or, or a post-millennialist, or a dispensationalist, or a historic premillennialist, all those categories, good guys who I love, right, go to conferences from those categories. When we get down to it, it's going to come down to interpretive principles, okay? Um, so, which then means figuring out how the New Testament cites the Old Testament and explaining it is crucial because at the end of the day, if you've got different hermeneutics, if you've got different principles of interpretation, how do you know which one's right? The one that most closely approaches the apostolic hermeneutic. In other words, if we're interpreting the Bible slightly differently and we, rec- and we can re- articulate and recognize that difference, I'm going to say, okay, which one of us is right? The one of us who's closer to the way Jesus, Paul, and the apostles in the New Testament cite the Old Testament's right, okay? So... Precisely because nothing overtly messianic jumps out of Psalm 102 is why many conclude spiritual interpretations are really valid. Because they'll freely admit, yeah, there's nothing overtly messianic in 102. You need Hebrews 1 to tell you it's messianic. You need Hebrews 1, as it were, to give you the answer at the back of the book. It's about Jesus, apparently. Okay, it looks, it's like that joke about the squirrel, right? You, You know that one? Youth pastor goes down and the short, short version... Trying to get the kids involved. Okay, I'm thinking of something. It's an animal. It scampers around the tree. It's got a big bushy tail. It collects nuts. What is it? Pastor, I know the answer is Jesus, but it still sounds an awful lot like a squirrel to me. You know, <laughs> right. Okay. At least a couple of you hadn't heard that. Okay. And I did the truncated version of the joke. Okay. So I'd like to take a moment to talk about why, how, how this is used. Because once you assume, oh, the New Testament can find, if, let me jump back a step further. If you, there are difficult passages where the New Testament cites the Old Testament. There are passages where it's hard to get, and he, the book of Hebrews and the book of Matthew are probably the two most challenging in their citations of the Old Testament um, and understanding their rationale. You can be tempted to conclude under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the New Testament authors, without any valid prior reasoning, are applying new meanings to texts in the Old Testament. You, you might conclude that. I don't think that's the right conclusion. But when you're faced with some really difficult passages, Matthew, out of Egypt I called my son, and you go back and you look in Hosea, and it's talking about Israel being brought up out of Egypt. Oh, and, and one possible I guess, I guess we can just take Israel, and it's really talking about Jesus, I guess. You know, and the Bible's talking about Jesus in all sorts of places where I never knew it was talking about Jesus, I guess. You know, it, it, one possible solution is that then that's going to set a precedent where you're going to be much more comfortable saying, well, I know it's talking about Zion and Jerusalem, but maybe it's talking about something else. Just like this other bit that looks like it's talking about Israel is really talking about Jesus. I'm I'm doing this really quick and using really broad brushstrokes. So figuring out how Hebrews cites this, which we're going to do in three minutes. I was going to do it inductively. I'm just going to tell you what I think it says and see if you can buy it or not. But anyway, um, then to answer your question directly. So let's go to Hebrews 1. Um, and the argument of Hebrews 1 is that Jesus is superior to angels. He's going to argue that Jesus is superior to a bunch of other things. But in Hebrews 1, the primary point is Jesus is not the greatest angel. Um, Mormons should take a look at Hebrews 1. No, Zeb, no, yes? I thought Mormons thought he was an angel, no? It's Jehovah Witnesses? I confuse my cults, my bad, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, no, I don't mean any slander, thank you. Zeb, when Zeb looks up, I'm like, uh-oh. Like, every, as I'm describing all millennialism and stuff, I'm looking, keep like, Zeb will give me the eyebrows if I radically misrepresent somebody. Fair enough, no, we, we don't want to misrepresent people, so. Okay, Hebrews 1, Jesus is better than angels. Um, so, so you, you pick up that theme in one five for to which of the angels did God ever say? And the rest of this chapter one is him citing, um, I th- no, it's not all Psalms. It's Psalms, Samuel, Deuteronomy. And then, um, we'll pick it up in verse eight. 
But of the son, he says, oh, I'll pick it up in seven. Of the angels, so here's a contrast. He says one thing to the angels. He says another thing to the son. And by the contrast of these things, we see Jesus is greater than angels. So of the angels, he says, and he cites Psalm 104, verse 4, he makes his angels and his ministers a flame of fire. So angels are ministers, they're servants. But of the son, he says, and then he quotes, a clearly messianic son, Psalm 45, 6 and 7, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. That's Psalm 45, 6 through 7. And we're clearly dealing with Messiah King here. Because remember, what is the word Messiah a transliteration of? It's just Hebrew, Messiah, which means what in English? And there's that word right there in verse 9. Therefore, God, your God has messiached you. He's anointed you. So here's Messiah King, the anointed king, um, who has his throne forever and ever. And then he cites, and you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands, but they will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your ears will Your years will have no end. And so some people suggest, even though there's nothing in Psalm 2 that I can see to indicate it, somehow, suddenly, even though the opening of the Psalm 102, our Psalm today, is to the Lord, all caps, Yahweh, that at some point in the Psalm, the Psalmist of 102 starts talking to the Son. That's the suggestion. And I see nothing in Psalm 102 to suggest that. Nothing to suggest at the end, oh, now he's talking about Jesus. Um, so that's the suggestion. So that, then that's where people can say, well, I guess, I guess, even though it may look like one thing, it really could be another thing going on. I don't think that's what's going on at all. I don't think in Psalm 102, the psalmist is directly addressing the second person of the Godhead. I don't think that at all. Um, I think the argument is as follows. The son has a forever and ever throne. In contrast, the angels were ministering flyers. And Psalm 102 makes it clear, especially at that climactic passage of Psalm 102, there is only one being who is forever and ever. In contrast to the stars and in contrast to the earth, there is only one who is forever and ever. So if the sun has a forever and ever throne, he must be divine. Because Psalm 102, in other words, all it's saying is, as Psalm 102 clearly lays out, only God in contrast to all creation is forever and ever, which is most strongly made at the end of Psalm 102. You fashioned the earth, it's going to rot away like a, like a moth-eaten garment you endure, right? So God alone possesses forever and everness. And yet in Psalm 45, we hear the sun has a forever and ever throne. Conclusion, sun's greater than the angels. I think that's the logic. So, answering your question, we're going to go two minutes over. <laughs> going two minutes over. I, I tried to make this point in the message. For an Israelite, we know especially, there's a sense in which your loyalty to your own tribe is a good thing. Paul talks about his kinsmen according to the flesh, how he could wish himself accursed on their behalf. And it's not just, I think, because they have the promises of God. I think it's particularly because they're Jewish. But you know, any person feeling a, a, a concern for their kin, for their, their tribe, their nationality, I think, I think can be good and right. Um, and so there's a sense in which he's particularly excited about Zion being rebuilt because Zion is the capital city of his people. Um, but more to the point... In Psalm 102, Zion is going to be the capital of global worship, okay? And I'm insisting that that's literal. Tons of other Old Testament passages make it clear God is going to have a worldwide kingdom on earth with Jesus reigning from Jerusalem. I mean, our study through the book of Zechariah makes that clear. Now, it is true, and I think you could make this application, Just as the psalmist finds comfort and solace in contemplating the certainty of God's glorious plans for his covenant people Israel, so we too could also find comfort and solace in considering God's certain plans to glorify his bride, the church. 
just as we could find solace and comfort in his future plans to judge the world in righteousness, just as we could find comfort in his future plans to make an eternal um, new heavens and new earth, right? I mean, there's a sense in which you could take... The, the problem is if you just take that and then try to erase the original meaning. And there's no way on earth you're going to convince me any Israelite reading this wouldn't think we're talking about Jerusalem. To which the person that wants to say it's just the spiritual, did it ever mean Jerusalem? And if so, when did it stop meaning that? That that would be my hermeneutic question. Did this ever reference Jerusalem? And if it ever did reference Jerusalem, literally, when did it stop meaning that? Or, to the amillennialists, even when it was written, it was never about Jerusalem which I think is a crazy stretch. Um, so showing that the author of Hebrews is not spiritualizing the passage and finding presto changeo, here's Jesus at the end of Psalm 102, I don't think that's what's going on at all. I think the argument simply, Psalm 102 drastically shows the contrast that really only God possesses forever and everness. Yet to this son, Messiah, king, he is a forever and ever throne. Hmm. I think that's the use in Hebrews. A literal, grammatical approach helps us realize, take, take these things, you can do real exegesis and really work through it. It's not just, Matt, well, I guess it's about Jesus, you know, which is, I think, frequently what we'll try to do. I mean, if you ever get Matthew Henry's commentary, he is finding Jesus behind every bale of hay and every pile of stones. It's good stuff, but, but the Puritans said there's exegesis, getting the meaning out of the text. There's eisegesis, reading things into the text. And then there's I see Jesus, which is spotting him everywhere. Um, and and you got to be careful of that, too. Like, we want that if he's there, he's there. And certainly the New Testament can give us in, in, you know, indications and check our math. But it's all too easy. Here's the problem with preaching, and I'll end with this. If I tell you something's about Jesus, who's going to complain the red cord coming down from Rahab's window is symbolizing the blood of Jesus. And people go, oh, that's deep. Show me anything in Moses' mind, Joshua's mind, indicate that. Maybe, no, maybe it is, but argue on those terms, not just because this shares a similarity with this. Joseph's a type of Christ. Why is Joseph a type of Christ? Well, he was betrayed by his brothers, and he was suffered unjustly, but through his suffering, he was able to redeem many people. Okay, maybe... But frequently, just that alone will make people go, oh, you know, show me in the text it's about that. Because I can start doing this really weird and show you how all sorts of people are a type of Jesus that you wouldn't want to argue are a type of Jesus. Um, and so there's a danger of just because it isn't it pleasing to find some things about Jesus? Isn't that what we'd like? That we can just think less critically. Um, and, we will, and then you start getting a sloppy hermeneutic, and then you become an amillennialist. Um, Okay, sorry. That's that's a dig. Completely dig. We're we're closing it. Good night. Good day. Thank you. See you all next week. As before before we get some mic, we're gonna.